In this lesson, we're going to go over how to approach criminal law fact patterns from a really big picture. Right, so step one, right, criminal law is unique in that we do have certain ultimate issues we're generally always working towards, right, at least for our purposes in law school or the bar exam, right, generally we're looking at whether a defendant can be found liable of various crimes, right, criminally liable for various crimes, right? And we're going to talk about all kinds of different crimes as we work through this course, right? We're gonna talk about harms to the person, things like murder and manslaughter and battery and assault. And we're going to talk about harms to the habitation, things like burglary and arson. We're going to talk about all the property offenses, right? Larceny, embezzlement, false pretenses, receipt of stolen property, right? We're going to talk about all these different crimes right as we work through this course and really though we're going to see that the ultimate issue when we're discussing all of these crimes is whether the defendant can be found liable for these crimes right? and we'll see at its core each crime consists of different elements right and to determine whether a defendant is criminally liable for various crimes all we're going to do is apply the elements to the fact pattern to come to conclusions, right, as to whether or not the defendant can be found liable or not liable in court, right? But we'll talk about this in a lot more detail and kind of how to format it and structure your essays because criminal law is unique in that you can have certain formulaic or systematic approaches just by the nature of what's being tested in criminal law. So we'll go over at the end of this lesson kind of how to structure essays, things to consider when we're writing essays, just how to approach an issue spot from a really big picture. But before we get into that, right, we do need to go over some really basic procedural stuff, just the big picture procedural context when we're thinking about criminal law. Right, essentially, how does a person actually get convicted of a crime? What is the process? How do you go from walking down the street, minding your own business, to being convicted in court of a crime? Well, step one for our purposes, right, is usually the police go out and investigate crimes, right? They're going to go out with the purpose of finding evidence to be used against a person in court, right? So the police go out and they investigate crimes, right? They search for and seize evidence, which is ultimately used against defendants in court. Now, we know from our criminal procedure course, right, that there is a lot of rules that the police have to follow, right? Mainly we're thinking about the U.S. Constitution, right? We know that we have the Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment, Sixth Amendment, Miranda v. Arizona, all this stuff in which the police must consider when they conduct investigations, right? In order to conduct lawful investigations, the police are going to have to make sure that they're searching for and seizing evidence in accordance with the Fourth Amendment, that they're interrogating suspects in accordance with the Fifth and Sixth Amendment, right? That they're not violating anybody's Miranda rights, right? And we talk about all of this in criminal procedure. In this course, in criminal law, we're not going to focus on any of these issues. Those are criminal procedure issues, right? What we're going to focus on in criminal law is once the investigation is completed, right, and a defendant is actually charged with a crime, moving forward, right, that's usually the stage we're in in criminal law fact patterns, right? We're actually in court seeing whether or not a defendant can be convicted of a crime or not convicted of a crime, right? So we're past the investigative stage and we're moving on to the point where the defendant is actually charged with the crime. And remember our ultimate issues, okay, once we get to court, is the defendant, can the defendant be found liable for whatever crime the defendant has been charged with, right? So in order to make this determination, we need to have some understanding of different burdens of proof. Right, and there's two main burdens we need to be aware of. We have the burden of production and the burden of persuasion, right? The burden of production is a question of law that is decided by the judge. The burden of persuasion is a question of fact that is decided by the trier of fact, which is usually the jury, right? 
So the burden of production, the way this works is once we get to court, right? A defendant has been charged with a crime. Take any crime, let's say murder. Right? The defendant has been charged with murder. Well, once we get to court, the first thing that has to happen, right, is the prosecutor has to meet the burden of production, right? The prosecutor must produce sufficient evidence such that a rational trier of fact could reasonably determine that the elements of the crime have been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. And we're going to talk about what this means in a minute, right? This proven beyond a reasonable doubt. But let's focus on the first part of this, right? In order to satisfy the burden of production, right, which is the first thing that has to happen, if the prosecutor, right, if the prosecution wants to convict a defendant of a crime, the first thing the prosecutor needs to do is satisfy the burden of production, right? And that's going to require that the prosecutor put forth evidence that goes to each element of the crime, right? And the evidence must be sufficient, right? It has to be sufficient such that a rational trier of fact could reasonably determine that the elements of the crime have been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, right? So let's go back to our murder example, right? So common law murder, we're typically going to have three elements, right? The prosecution is going to have the burden of proving three elements beyond a reasonable doubt, right? Number one, that there was an unlawful killing. Number two, of another human being. Number three, with malice aforethought, right? So we need a killing of another human being with malice aforethought. Right? The prosecution is going to have to produce evidence that goes to each of those three elements to meet their burden of production. And they have to produce enough evidence, sufficient evidence, such that a rational trier of fact could reasonably determine that the elements of the crime have been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Right? So if the prosecution makes their whole case, right, they present all of their evidence, but they never establish that the victim of the crime is a human being, right? Say they just use the person's name, they say, you know, Alan was killed, but we never establish that Alan was actually a human being. For all we know, Alan could be a pet cat or a tree, right? We don't know who Alan is. If the prosecution never puts forth any evidence that Alan, this person or this, you know, living thing that died, right, was actually a human being, right, then they haven't produced sufficient evidence such that a rational trier of fact could reasonably determine that the elements of the crime have been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Right, so what happens here is, remember, the burden of production is a question of law, right? So once the prosecution goes and they close, right, they basically have put forth all the evidence that they're going to put forth. So let's say that the prosecution rests, right? They are not going to put forth any more evidence, but they've failed to put forth any evidence that shows that the victim here is actually a human being. Well, at that point, right, what's the defense going to do? They're going to file a motion for a directed verdict. And in that case, right, because the prosecution has not met their burden of production, they haven't put forth any evidence that goes to the second element of a crime, right, the judge is going to look at that and say, well, look, the prosecutor here did not produce any evidence such that a rational trier fact could reasonably determine that that second element of the crime has been proven, right? The prosecution has not established that the victim here is a human being, right? We went through the whole prosecutor's case, right? They presented all their evidence and they just kept using some random name, Alan, Alan this, Alan this, Alan was alive, now Alan's dead, but we don't know who or what Alan actually is. Is it a pet dog? Is it a pet cat? Is it a family tree that was planted outside? You know, what is Alan? Is Alan a human being or some sort of animal or something else? Right? If that was never established, then the prosecutor has failed to meet their burden of production. At that point, it's never going to go to the trier of fact, right? The case is not going to go to the jury. The judge is going to say, you know what? I'm directing a verdict in favor of the defendant. Defendant is entitled to acquittal. Right, and so in that case, the, it never goes to the jury. Right, the burden of production is not satisfied. the The judge is going to direct a verdict in favor of the defendant. 
Right, so step number one, the prosecutor has to produce sufficient evidence such that a rational trier of fact could reasonably determine that the elements of the crime have been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Now remember, this is decided by the judge, and this is the operative word. The judge is going to look at the prosecutor's case, right, after they have presented all of their evidence, right, the prosecution comes and they put forth all of the evidence they're going to produce. The judge looks at the evidence that's been produced and says, okay, could, at this point, with the evidence that the prosecution has put forth, could a rational trier of fact reasonably determine that each of these elements have been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Not would the jury, is it likely the jury is going to find in favor of the prosecution? That's not what the judge is doing. The judge is just asking, could a rational trier of fact reasonably determine that the elements of the crime have been proven beyond a reasonable doubt? If the judge says, yes, okay, you have at least met the burden of production. You've put forth sufficient evidence such that a rational trier of fact could reasonably determine that the elements of the crime have been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Then we go to the burden of persuasion, right? At that point, the judge is going to allow the jury to render a verdict. Right? If the burden of production is not satisfied, right, the judge can step in and direct a verdict in favor of the defendant before it even gets to the jury. But once that burden of production is satisfied, then once the prosecutor satisfies that burden of production, now we go to the burden of persuasion. Right? The judge is going to let that case go to the jury and the trier of fact, right, the jury is going to render a verdict. Right? So again, burden of production is a question of law that's decided by the judge. Burden of persuasion is a question of fact that's decided by the trier of fact, which is usually the jury, right? So after the burden of production has been satisfied, right? So burden of production is satisfied. Prosecution satisfies the burden of production, right? Now the case is going to go to the jury, the trier of fact, right? And the prosecution must prove basically to the trier of fact that every element of the crime has been satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt, right? This standard, this burden, right, beyond a reasonable doubt is one of the highest burdens that we have in U.S. law, right? Beyond a reasonable doubt is a very, very high standard that the prosecution has to meet, right? When we say the prosecution must prove every element of the crime beyond a reasonable doubt, Right? That's way more than preponderance of the evidence. Right? Remember, in civil cases, we say that usually the plaintiff has the burden of proving each element right, by a preponderance of the evidence. Right? In other words, you can think of preponderance of the evidence as more likely than not. Or if you want to attach a percent to it, you can kind of think of it as anything over 50%, right? 51% would be preponderance of the evidence. Right, so if we think about the spectrum of certainty a person can have, right, and we're thinking about beyond a reasonable doubt, right, it's way beyond what would be required to demonstrate preponderance of the evidence. If you think back to something like torts, right, civil cases, right, you think about negligence, right, if the plaintiff is suing a defendant for negligence, right? Remember, they have to prove duty, breach, causation, and damages by a preponderance of the evidence, which basically means they have to show that each element is more likely to have occurred than not, right? So if the jury can say, I'm 51% sure each of these elements are satisfied, that's enough, right? In civil cases, not criminal cases, civil cases, things like breach of contract, right? Tort claims, right? We know it's generally going to be a preponderance of the evidence standard, right? The plaintiff has the burden of proving each element of the claim, right? By a preponderance of the evidence, which is more likely than not, right? Or 51% if you want to think about it as a percentage in your head. Anything over 50% satisfies this burden of preponderance of the evidence. Next, as a burden you'll sometimes hear in law in different circumstances is this idea of clear and convincing evidence, right? When we say that someone has the burden of proving an element or some sort of claim by clear and convincing evidence, 
right? That's higher than preponderance of evidence, but it's still not the ultimate, right, that we have in criminal cases, right? This idea of beyond a reasonable doubt, right? And so courts are going to be very hesitant to actually attach a percentage to this idea of proving each element beyond a reasonable doubt. So I'm not gonna give you an actual percentage here, right? But the idea is it's a very high standard. Basically, if the trier of fact, the jury usually, has any reasonable doubt in their mind as to any elements of the crime, say there's five elements and the juror is convinced, right, beyond a reasonable doubt that four of those five elements have been satisfied, but they're iffy on that fifth one. They have some reasonable doubt in their head Right? It's the duty of that juror to vote for an acquittal. Right? They, every element has to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. So if a juror has any reasonable doubt in their head as to whether or not the prosecution has proven an element of the crime beyond a reasonable doubt, right? the juror's duty is to vote for an acquittal. Right, so it's a very high standard. And this standard, right, the burden of persuasion is a question of fact, right? It's not a question of law. The judge decides questions of law, which would be the burden of production. The burden of persuasion is for the trier of fact to decide. So ultimately, to convict a defendant of a crime, remember, Step number one, the prosecutor has to satisfy the burden of production, right? They have to put sufficient evidence towards each element, right? If a prosecutor just fails to put evidence towards an element for some reason, right, they're going to fail this burden of production and the judge at that point might be able to direct a verdict for the defendant. Right, and so classically with the burden of production, another example of this would be where evidence has been suppressed, right? Think about the crime of receipt of stolen property, right? We're going to talk about this. Receipt of property at common law is a crime, right? Basically, if somebody tells you that they've stolen an item and they ask if you want it and you take that item, you know, with the intent to permanently deprive the owner of that property and you know it's stolen property, right? That's a crime, right? Say that your buddy comes to you and says, hey, guess what? I stole my neighbor's diamond ring. It's worth $100,000. You know, I'm too scared to hold on to this myself. I don't want to get in trouble. Do you want the diamond ring? Right? And you knowing that it's stolen property, take possession and control of the diamond ring, right? That at common law is the crime of receipt of stolen property, right? So let's say that you take this diamond ring and one day it's sitting in your home, let's say. The police barge in without a search warrant and find the stolen diamond ring. And let's say that you are charged with the crime of receipt of stolen property. Right, well, clearly you've committed that crime, right? Let's say that the elements at common law, let's say there's five elements, right? Receipt of stolen property consists of receiving possession and control of stolen property known to have been obtained in an unlawful manner by another person with the intent to permanently deprive the owner of the property, right? But we can really just focus on those first two elements, right? Receiving possession, receiving possession and control of stolen property, right? So in order to be convicted of that crime, those two elements have to be satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt, right? We know the prosecution is going to have the burden of proving that you received possession and control of stolen property beyond a reasonable doubt, right? So let's say that you're charged with this crime and we get to court and at some point there's a motion to suppress the evidence of the diamond ring. Let's say because the police, and remember this is a criminal procedure issue, not a criminal law issue, but let's say that the police violated the defendant's Fourth Amendment rights in searching for and seizing that diamond ring, right? They performed the search in a constitutionally protected area without a search warrant, no exceptions apply. So let's say that there is a violation of the defendant's Fourth Amendment rights. Therefore, the judge ultimately rules that evidence from that search and seizure is not admissible in court, right? Well, how is the prosecution going to prove beyond a reasonable doubt 
that the defendant was in possession of the diamond ring if the diamond ring itself is not admissible in court. Right? At that point, if the prosecution, the only evidence that the prosecution has that the defendant was in possession of the diamond ring is a result of this illegal search and seizure performed by the government, when that gets thrown out, now the prosecution cannot produce any evidence that establishes that the defendant was in possession of the stolen property, right? Because that Fourth Amendment violation now makes that evidence inadmissible, right? So at that point, the prosecution's not going to be able to meet the burden of production. Once that evidence is no longer admissible in court, right, there's no way the judge is going to look at that and say, well, look, the prosecution cannot produce sufficient evidence such that a rational trier of fact could reasonably determine that the element, right, that this person, this defendant receives stolen property has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, right? Because the item in question is no longer admissible, right? So the burden of production is not going to be able to be satisfied there. In that case, the judge would likely direct a verdict in favor of the defendant, wouldn't even get to the jury, right? So oftentimes where we're going to see problems with the burden of production would be when evidence the prosecutor thought they had gets thrown out, right? That's where we would typically most often see this, right? But assuming that the burden of production is met, right? The prosecution does put forth sufficient evidence to each element of the crime such that a rational trier effect could reasonably determine that each element of the crime has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt as decided by the judge, right, then that means it's going to go to the jury. And the trier of fact is going to decide whether or not every element of the crime has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. If the prosecution establishes both of these burdens, right, meets both of these burdens, satisfies the burden of production and the burden of persuasion, absent a defense, right, that means the defendant is going to be convicted of the crime. At least the defendant should be convicted of the crime. Now we know what the law requires and what juries actually do in real life might be different, but for our purposes, right, we don't have to worry about that. If the prosecution meets both of these burdens, right, absent a defense raised or asserted by the defendant, right, that means that the defendant can be convicted of the crime he has been charged with, right? Once the prosecution has proven each element of the crime beyond a reasonable doubt, right, the trier of fact is then going to render a guilty verdict. We're going to have a formal conviction of the criminal defendant, right? So, that's your kind of two-step process from the prosecution standpoint. Now we'll see that sometimes the defendant has the option to raise affirmative defenses. If you think back to our murder example, right, the prosecution may be able to prove the three elements of murder beyond a reasonable doubt, right, that we have a killing of another human being with malice aforethought, but the defendant can raise or assert affirmative defenses, right? And if they can successfully assert an affirmative defense, they might be entitled to an acquittal, even though the prosecution can prove all the elements of the crime beyond a reasonable doubt, right? With murder, a common example you would see and we're going to talk about might be something like not guilty by reason of insanity. The defendant may say, yeah, sure, look, you can prove all three of these elements, but at the time this crime was committed, I was legally insane, right? Therefore, I should be entitled to acquittal, right? So in terms of how the burdens work when the defendant is raising affirmative defenses, all you really need to understand is that the defendant has the burden of producing evidence pertaining to any affirmative defense he wishes to raise. Right, so it's important to recognize that the prosecution does not have to provide evidence of an affirmative defense on the defendant's behalf. Right, if the defendant wants to assert a not guilty by reason of insanity defense, right, the burden of producing evidence is going to be on the defendant. Right, the prosecution doesn't have to go out and find evidence for the defendant. Right, the defendant has to put forth the evidence himself.
Now, usually when we think about, well, what is sufficient evidence to meet the burden of production, right? It's an even lower standard than what the prosecutor has to meet, right? As long as the evidence is somewhat reasonable, right? It's generally going, as long as it reasonably goes to, right, what's being asserted, right? The judge is usually going to let that go to the jury to decide, right? The idea is once the burden of production is met, the defendant then is going to be entitled to at least having the instructions read to the jury regarding that affirmative defense. But that's a very low burden for the defendant to meet, right? They just have to produce some sort of evidence, right? As long as it's reasonable pertaining to any affirmative defenses he wishes to raise. Right, and then once we get past, once the defendant gets past the burden of production, right, once the defendant gets past the burden of production, that's going to entitle the defendant to at least a jury instruction. So the jury is going to be informed of the affirmative defense. The judge is going to tell the jury what elements have to be satisfied by the defendant or disproven by the prosecution, depending on what jurisdiction we're in, in order for the defendant to be entitled to that affirmative defense. But the idea here is at common law, the burden of persuasion regarding affirmative defenses rested on the defendant. We see today in some jurisdictions, the prosecution actually has the burden of disproving affirmative defenses raised by the defendant beyond a reasonable doubt. But at common law, the burden of persuasion regarding affirmative defenses rested on the defendant. This would actually be a preponderance standard, right? In most jurisdictions where we're going to have the burden of persuasion regarding affirmative defenses resting on the defendant, the defendant doesn't have to prove all the elements of the defense beyond a reasonable doubt, right? That's what the prosecution's burden of persuasion is. Usually for the defendant, it's just the preponderance of the evidence, right? Meaning if the defendant's going to say, hey, look, I'm not guilty by reasonable reason of insanity, they don't have to prove that they're not guilty by reason of insanity beyond a reasonable doubt. They only have to prove it beyond or by a preponderance of the evidence, meaning that whatever the elements of that affirmative defense are, they have to prove each of those elements by a preponderance of the evidence, meaning it's more likely than not each element is satisfied. The idea here is the takeaway should be that the burdens are a little bit lower for the defendant drastically lower in certain instances, right? When we're thinking about affirmative defenses, right? So as long as you understand though, the main idea is step one, right? The prosecution starts, right? And the prosecution has the burden of producing sufficient evidence, right? To meet the burden of production. And then the burden of persuasion for the prosecution goes to the trier of fact. Prosecution must prove every element of the crime beyond a reasonable doubt. As long as you understand that, that's usually what we're focused on in terms of criminal law. In terms of the actual burden of production and burden of persuasion for the defendant, all you really need to know is that the defendant is usually going to have the burden of producing evidence pertaining to him for any affirmative defense he wishes to raise. Right, so the defendant, if he's going to raise a defense, he's the one has to produce evidence that goes toward that offense. And usually, right, at common law, the burden of persuasion regarding affirmative defenses rested on the defendant, which means that the defendant actually has to prove each element of the defense by a preponderance of the evidence. Of course, today in some jurisdictions, we know that actually the burden of persuasion and regarding affirmative defenses is going to be on the prosecution, where we would say the prosecution actually has the burden of disproving the elements of the claim or defense, right, of the defense of the affirmative defense that's being raised by beyond a reasonable doubt. Right, but these are our burdens of production and burdens of persuasion, right? That's ultimately how a person goes from walking down the street to eventually being convicted of a crime in court, right? The prosecution has to satisfy the burdens of production and burdens of persuasion, right? And again, this is past the police investigation stage, right? Police investigation is usually criminal procedure issues, right? That's things like Fourth Amendment searches and seizures, Fifth Amendment, Sixth Amendment, Miranda rights, all of that stuff that's required of the police during the investigative process are all criminal procedure issues. What we're focusing on in criminal law is after the police investigation, once the defendant is formally charged and we get to court, right? How do we determine whether the defendant is going to be convicted of a crime or not convicted of a crime, 
Well, we know, right? Big picture, prosecution has to meet the burden of production and the burden of persuasion, right? They have to put forth sufficient evidence such that a rational trier effect could reasonably determine that the elements of the crime have been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Once they satisfied the burden of production, right, the judge is going to allow that decision, the actual verdict as to whether or not the defendant is guilty or not guilty, to be decided by the trier of fact. At that point, the prosecution must prove every element of the crime beyond a reasonable doubt to actually get that guilty verdict. To obtain a guilty verdict and criminally convict a defendant, right, every element of the crime must be proven beyond a reasonable doubt which we understand is a very, very high burden. Right? This is beyond preponderance of the evidence, it's beyond clear and convincing evidence. Right? We have to get to a high level of certainty. It doesn't have to be 100% certainty, but it is beyond a reasonable doubt. Which means if a juror has any reasonable doubt regarding any element of the crime, their duty is to vote for an acquittal. Right, so that's big picture. In terms of how we actually format this on an essay, right, the way that I would recommend doing this, what a lot of our students have had success with, is number one, your first header, right, when you're thinking about structuring your actual criminal law essay. Thank you so much for watching this video preview of our Legal Education Accelerator Program, or LEAP for short. If you would like to see the conclusion of this video and gain full access to our entire 1L and 2L video library, integrated outlines, streamable audio versions, additional practice exams with explanations, and much more, we invite you to head over to our website and join the thousands of law students who have already enrolled. To get started with your no-risk free trial today, simply click the link in the description box below or visit www.studicata.com forward slash leap. Hi everyone, my name is Serena and I'm currently a law student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Shiva and I'm currently a law student at Southwestern. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle um, and I am a first year student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Um, I used the Studicata study video series last semester to help me prepare mostly for contracts um, and I actually made an A plus in contracts last semester which I greatly dedicate to the Studicata video. By using Studicata to help me prepare for my final exam, I was able to score the highest grade out of my class on the final and even have my uh, essay distributed as the model answer. Not to mention I had done quite poorly on the midterm and was struggling throughout the whole course of the semester, understanding the material and keeping up with lectures. Because of the Studicata video lectures, I was able to go into my exams with a feeling of confidence. I didn't have to worry about what the rules of law were or how I was going to organize my answer to an essay question. I would absolutely recommend the Studicata series and their online course materials to anyone. Um, I think that they are not like um, professor lectures that you might find online or other outside study materials that you may encounter. Um, I think that the Studicata videos really focus on not only ensuring that you understand the material that you're going to encounter on your final, um, but they also help you to understand kind of the best method for test taking and they really break down how to approach each problem and the best ways to tackle certain methods on testing um, and I think that's really important and I think it's really special. I don't see that anywhere else um, in any of the other online resources that I've found. So I would certainly recommend Sudakata to anyone who is studying in law school right now. Um, good luck on your studying and you're going to do great. I would definitely uh, recommend Studicata to anybody watching this video. Uh, give it a chance. I'm sure, I'm positive that you will love it, uh, that you will get a lot out of it, uh, and that you will be happy that you gave it a chance. Uh, I definitely am. I know I will be using uh, Studicata in the future. And I cannot thank Studicata enough for getting me through my first semester of law school. I will definitely, definitely continue to watch the Studicata video lectures throughout my law school career. And I highly recommend that any future or current law student do the same.